I'm going to read you a little extract from my new book, Diamond. I hoped it would get easier. After all, I could now turn neat somersaults as easily as winking. But the human column was different. It was a twice daily terror. Juliet was right. The fear never went away. But there were good times too. I loved visiting Madame Adeline and eating cake and chocolates. I loved chatting to Mr. Marvel and playing with little Mavis. But even then, when I was most relaxed, the fear was there in the pit of my stomach. Mr. haunted me every day and stalked my dreams at night. I could never please him now. The more he threatened me, the worse I got, until I stumbled doing the simplest cartwheel and started whenever he said my name. I developed a nervous twitch that made him even madder. Stop jerking about like a little lunatic. Stop it at once, I say, he'd hiss. I put my hands to my face, struggling to keep it still, but I could feel it twitching beneath my fingers. I lost all sense of where we were and how far we had travelled. We pulled down the big top every week, rain or shine, travelled through the night, arrived at a new town or village, slept through the morning and rehearsed and performed all the rest of the week. We could have been down in sunny Cornwall or up in chilly Inverness for all I knew. We might even have returned to my own hometown without my realising. I never left the circus field and they all looked alike anyway. I didn't know, I ceased to care. I took part in the circus parade through towns and villages and barely noticed whether I was passing great stone mansions or humble cottages. All I had to do was smile until my cheeks ached. Smile even when my eyes pricked with tears. I was hiding under the wagon one evening because Mr. had threatened me with a beating and I was pretty sure he meant it. I couldn't help sobbing, though I put my hands over my face to try to stifle the sounds. Then I heard a scuffle and someone bent right down and peered under the wagon at me. Yes, Hetty, it was you. I was so startled I curled up small, trying to hide. It's all right, I'm not going to hurt you, the someone whispered, and I won't let anyone else hurt you either. See my red hair? I'm so fierce that everyone is scared of me. Even the biggest, ugliest ogre quakes when he sees me coming. Evil giants tremble and whimper at my approach. I couldn't help giggling. I wasn't sure if this strange girl was grown up or still a child. She was very little, like me but she was wearing a prim cotton ladies dress, though she wore her long hair loose about her shoulders, not caught up in a neat bun. I loved her voice. She didn't sound like the circus folk. She didn't sound like the Willoughby Buildings people. She didn't sound like the gentle country folk. She didn't sound like the proper ladies and gents who lived in big houses. She simply sounded like herself, warm and friendly and funny. But I never ever hurt little fairy girl, she said. And you're a little fairy, aren't you? I shivered at the name because that was what Mr. called me, but I could tell she meant it kindly. She couldn't think I was really a fairy, could she? Please, miss, I'm the acrobatic child wonder, I explained, wiping my eyes and sniffling. Here, I have a handkerchief, she said, pulling a little piece of cloth from her pocket. It had embroidery all over it. There's pictures and letters, I said, stroking the little blue and yellow satin thread flowers. They were bluebells and primroses. I remembered Mary Martha taking me to the woods long ago, where we picked great bunches of flowers and brought them home for Ma. We put them in jam jars all around the room and they looked so beautiful that we clapped our hands and laughed and even Ma seemed happy. But within a few hours, our beautiful flowers were drooping and dying, and we had to throw them away. I traced the letters embroidered underneath. The girl sensed I was less sure now and told me they were her initials, SB for Sapphire Battersea. Although no one calls me that now, all the folk here call me Hetty. 
I said I was called Diamond, and she thought it a most beautiful name, which pleased me greatly. I thought the handkerchief so pretty, I didn't want to spoil it, so I wiped my nose on my petticoat instead. Hetty smiled at me and said I could keep the handkerchief if I liked it so much. Really? For my very own, I said, and I tucked it away quickly in case she changed her mind. Hetty tried to persuade me to creep out from under the wagon. I'm scared to come out because Mr. will get me, I said. Hetty looked horrified when I said he would beat me. Can you tell your father? she asked. She said the word father as if she thought all fathers very special men who protected their daughters. I thought of my own pa and how he'd sold me for five guineas and I started sobbing again. Isn't there anyone kind who will look after you? Hetty asked, wriggling under the wagon too, so she could put her arm round me. Madam Addy is kind, I said. Hetty's whole face lit up. Oh, Madam Adeline. Yes, I'm sure she is very kind, she said, as if she knew her. I've come looking for her. Will you show me her wagon, Diamond? So I crawled out and she took my hand, squeezing it tightly when we went past Mr's wagon. We went to Madame Adeline's lovely green wagon right at the end. She was sitting on her steps before her fire, wearing her favourite green silk gown, looking magical. She saw the tear stains on my face and held out her arms to me. Come here, darling, she said, and I ran to her, proud that Hetty should see that such a lovely exotic lady cared for me. She cared for Hetty, too. She called her her little star, and this made Hetty burst into tears, too. They talked of when they'd last met, both so tender, and then Hetty cried again when she said that she'd lost her dear mamma. Is your mother dead, too, Hetty? I asked. Mine went to live with the angels. My mamma lives there too, said Hetty, wiping her eyes. I'm sure she has wonderful white feathery wings and a dress as blue as the sky. Maybe they fly from cloud to cloud together. But my mamma flies down to see me every now and then. She creeps inside my heart and speaks to me. She's a great comfort. Perhaps your mamma will do the same. I thought this over carefully. I wasn't really sure I welcomed the thought of Ma squatting beside me, watching my every move. I was sure she'd be disappointed in me. She'd weep more than ever. I put my thumb in my mouth and rocked myself sadly. Madame Adeline smiled at me comfortingly. Now, my girls, I'm going to have a cup of tea. Would you like one too? I took my thumb out of my mouth. And cake, I said hopefully. Madame Adeline laughed. I expect we can find a cake if we search hard, she said. She made a delightful game of it, pretending to hunt the cake in her beautiful wagon, looking under the table and in her bed, which was so funny I cheered up enormously. We ate our tea and each had a big slice of pink and yellow cake. I nibbled mine slowly, peeling off the marzipan and saving it till last because I liked it so much. But then I heard Mr. shouting and the cake turned sour in my mouth. I thought he was after me, but it turned out he was challenging a stranger from the village who'd come marching across the field and was running from wagon to wagon, calling for Hetty. Oh my Lord, it's Jem. He must have followed me, said Hetty, flushing. I peered out of Madame Adeline's wagon. This Jem looked very fierce and angry. A farm labourer with a cap and cords, so strongly built he was almost a match for Marvo. But when Madame Adeline intervened, he doffed his cap and shook her hand. Pleased to meet you, ma'am, he said, just like a gentleman. Madame Adeline offered him tea, but he politely refused. I'd better be getting back. And so had you, Hetty, he said firmly, taking hold of her arm. It was clear that Hetty didn't like this at all. I want to stay here with Madame Adeline, she said, sticking out her chin. I wanted her to say, and Diamond, too. I liked her so much. I wanted her to stay forever. She made me feel I didn't need to be so frightened anymore. But Jem was intent on chivying her out of the wagon, his arm about her. Perhaps you'd better run along with your brother just now, little star. But will you come and see the show tomorrow? asked Madame Adeline. I would not miss it for the world, Hetty replied. She kissed Madame Adeline goodbye and then turned to me. 
I shall look out for you in the ring tomorrow and give you a big cheer, she told me.